So welcome to this um, couch session, as we also call it in the in the Zero Project world. Um, I'm really honored to host, host this uh, distinguished uh, discussion, this distinguished panel here today. And we're also in the fortunate position that nobody will want to leave with the weather outside here. So uh, <laughs> um, the joint mission of us here on the on the stage is to get a better understanding how to support the mission that we all have, which is uh, create um, a more inclusive and accessible society, how working and thinking international, how to enlarge your vision, how also technology um, can enhance this vision and what this could mean uh, in practice. Um, I will start by uh, giving my three fellow panelists and then myself a brief chance of, uh, of an introduction, introdu introducing uh, yourselves. Um, uh, Ron, Kirana, and, and Nakul, just one or two sentences about yourself. Uh, then we follow up with a presentation of yours. So each of my fellow panelists have pr uh, prepared a small presentation of maybe five minutes of explaining their work. Uh, and then we will follow up on, on, a, on a question on the, um, on the stage here on the dimensions of internationality, the technology that I mentioned already. So let's kick this off. Um, Ron, a very brief introduction of yourself. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron from SG Enable. I'm the Assistant Chief Executive in SG Enable. So uh, I'm an engineer by training. So naturally, I think my passion in disability sector is really how do we apply technology for the community. So the work that Engineering Good, uh, Kai in Smart BFA really resonates with me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kirana. Uh, I'm a program officer in Kota Kita. Our focus is actually on urban issue, but we are also working on inclusivity sector where we encourage um, citizens, particularly marginalized group, to also actively involve in uh, city development process. Thank you. And you're from uh, Solo City, Indonesia. We should also yeah. mention this uh, sector, yeah. so quite a diverse uh, uh, group on the, on the panel. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nakul Gaur. I lead demand generation in B2B e-commerce in Unilever. Uh, Unilever is one of the world's most successful purpose-driven companies. Uh, I've been with the organization for the last 15 years uh, and my work is more towards sales and marketing. In addition to that, I am also the leader for the employee resource group in Unilever for persons with disability. Uh, I'm also an inclusive champion with SG Enable, and yes, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Looking forward. Thank you, Nakul. So as you can see here, we are um, a panel that is really diverse in different angles. We are div uh, diverse in region of society sector, background of uh, disability, of gender, and many more issues, and we will use this to the best advantage of creating also a, a diverse discussion. But let's start this with uh, giving you a better uh, understanding of what uh, my panelists and myself are actually working on. So let's start with you, Ron. And yeah, sure. Uh, what thanks, Michael. So today I'll share briefly on our work on assistive technology and also a brief view of our plans ahead as well. So, yeah. So actually, our goal for assistive technology is very simple. It's really how do we make AT affordable and available to meet the needs of persons with disabilities. So I think when we look at this uh, problem statement, there's a lot of considerations to be made. Do we use mainstream technology that's affordable and easily accessible to the way, how do we actually need to customize to meet, prop to meet the specific, specific needs for the person with disabilities so that there will be proper fit as well? Then, of course, on everyone's mind, when we deal with assistive technology, it's always, is it costly? What is the budget that's actually available? And actually, do you want to go for the low tech or the high tech? I mean, it's always very attractive to always go for high tech solutions, but there's always a lot of constraints between budget and also availability as well. So I think this really uh, maps up the considerations that SG Enable has whenever we embark on AT initiatives. It's not that we always will go for high tech, but it's really what is the outcome that we want is really about having AT easily affordable and accessible to persons with disabilities. So to illustrate this, I'll have a short video as well. 
actually this project is a simple project that we actually work with the Google engineers to see how commercially available smart home technologies can be used to enable uh, persons with disabilities to enable them to be able to live independently. Yeah. Maybe I could start the video. To me, creativity is the root of technology. It's about finding creative solutions to problems. Hey Google, what's the weather right now? It's currently 31. Turn on the AC. Sure, turning on AC. Technology breaks down the barrier between what's on my mind and what I can do. As technology improves, the possibilities are endless. Hey Google, I'm leaving. Have a good day. Turning all appliances off. It allows me to do so much more. How do I get from Orchard to Novena? The best way to get from Orchard Road to Novena by And I can't wait to start my next adventure. As you can see, all the technology that's featured here, you can get it from any shops, you can get it from Amazon. It's really how do you put it together uh, to really raise the awareness of persons with disabilities as such technology is available. And the other reason why I want to showcase this is really part of our strategy is about simplicity. It's not always going for a very complex project, but actually we should go for a solution that's simple enough that people can understand and also willing to adopt as well, because that will actually, if it's simple enough to use, people will use it, right? It solves half, half, half of the problem. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is one of the examples where we thought that we really need to look into how we could leverage mainstream technologies, because if we are able to leverage mainstream technology, it is a lot easier to scale the solution, because it's already mass market in the first place. Then once it's mass market, the cost will come down as well. It makes the technology much affordable to everyone. So, uh, besides this smart home technology, another example I think everybody will know is text-to-speech function. For the, I think about 10, 20 years ago, right, you need specialized software, you need specialized devices to really use text-to-speech function. But now it comes with all our Apple iPhones and our Android phones as well. So the key is really, it's not just about developing a technology, by really raising the awareness of persons with disabilities that in your mobile phone, there's already technology available that can enable you to live your daily lives as well. So how do we actually try to raise this awareness for persons with disabilities? So that's where TechAble comes in, right? TechAble was set up uh, to be jointly managed but with SG Enable SPD. The main mission is really to raise the awareness and adoption of uh, uh, AT devices for persons with disabilities. It's an AT center where people, it doesn't just read up about AT devices, but it, physically people can come into the AT showcase to really try out the devices, talk to the AT specialist to really see what is the proper devices that will meet their needs in their daily living. So what we do in uh, yeah, TechAble is really providing the information and resources. We have different engagement outreach efforts. We have AT workshops, and definitely we have a web app where people can actually uh, access to really find out all the AT devices that is showcased in TechAble. And of course, the most importantly that we always encourage is to have proper assessment. Don't just buy AT devices online, then when you get it, you find that it doesn't meet your needs. So we always encourage persons with disabilities to visit TechAble to talk to our AT specialists to really see what is the best devices that will suit their daily needs, be it at work, study, or at home as well. Yeah, so we talk about raising awareness about uh, assistive technology. One big area that we do is also about engaging innovators. Right? I think uh, in the previous panel, you've already seen that uh, SG Enable works with a lot of different partners to really see how we can bring in different ideas to contribute back to the disability sector. Yeah. And you've also heard a lot just now from Elvin that uh, SG Enable administers the uh, Enabling Lives Initiative grant where we work with different partners to catalyze different innovation projects. 
So I think uh, we do have a positive social impact that was measured by the Singapore Man 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 Management Universities, where we do have uh, results and data to show that there's increased psychological and emotional well-being for a person with disabilities, better integration with society, as well as empowerment and support uh, through the outcome of, of all the different projects that were uh, funded. Yeah. So this slide is really to articulate that we don't just let a thousand uh, flowers bloom, right? We, what we really want to do is really to achieve collective impact in the focus areas that we have in, that we want to focus in Singapore, which is about living independently, realizing potentials, and connecting communities. So what we do is really about curating different projects to focus on collective impact in these areas and also encourage synergies and partnerships between innovators and, like the previous panel said, not to work in silos when people say, eh, how come I've spent two years working on a project, you also spent two years working on the same type of problem statement. So the outcome that we really want to achieve is about collective impact where people uh, share resources, share ideas, and also to be able to share the community uh, inputs to achieve that collective impact. So, so far, we spoke about collective impact. What we are looking forward to is really about building the AT professional and community network for collective growth. Because we do recognize that collective impact is very different in each country. We have different contexts, different uh, problem statements. But is it possible that we come together to really uh, raise the knowledge and skills and also exchange ideas between all the different partners around the region or in the world, right? So it's about then when we take back these ideas, it's really about how we adapt it back into our own countries to have collective impact. So I'm quite happy that today we have this forum. I see it as really the first step for SG Enable to really reach out to the different partners here today to really share about our learning experience, to collaborate on problem solving, and also to have the cross-functional expertise exchange as well to look for collective growth in all our, in together as a as a partner together as a community. So just this, this, just to, I would like to end off to say that SG Enable's role in Singapore is ready to advocate the catalyst as, as well as to enable the disability community and sector in Singapore. And this is the role that we'll be focusing on for the next few years. And for, of course, we want to work with the different partners here to be able to create equitable opportunities for persons with disabilities to aspire and fulfill their potential as well. So this is my last slide. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, thank you to serve an applause. Uh, Ron, just one question and a brief question and a brief answer on your side uh, yeah. before we hand over to Kirana. Um, you started and uh, fully see this picture with uh, the, the mission of creating affordable and available assistive technology. No? Um, I trust there's a major difference between uh, app and software driven solutions which yeah. mainly need to be programmed and then everyone can download them more or less on their smartphone or on their browser yeah. and hardware devices because mm. this needs to be produced, this needs to be shared, this needs to be redistributed. Mm. Could you give us one or two sentences on what this means in practice, this difference for your work and your approach? Yeah, so I think uh, when we go into the digital space, everything is commoditized, right? So everything is easily reached out. People just have to uh, go into the Play Store to download the apps. I think the challenge that we face in Singapore is again about sustainability, right? How do we actually find the resources to be able to maintain the app, to improve the app, and to have enough people to download the app? So I think one of the key things is that we recognize that Singapore is still a very small market, no matter how we do our population is this size. So I think one of the areas that we are looking at for sustainability for our local innovators is really how could we let, uh, reach out to a different region, to a bigger, dis bigger disability market out there in the world as well. So that even if it's in a software, uh, to make it affordable, it needs to be sustainable. Otherwise, like uh, the previous panelists say, after one or two years, the app might just disappear from the app store as well. Thank you, Ron. Now, over to you, Kirana and Kota Kita. Um, yeah, hi everyone, good afternoon. So uh, I'm Kirana from Kota Kita and today I would like to share on one of our uh, work related to participatory data collection. 
So just a glimpse about Kota Kita. So basically, we are a non-profit organization. We are based in Seoul City or Surakarta in Indonesia, and our expertise is in urban planning and also citizen participation in the design and development of the cities. And our project focuses around governance issue, inclusivity, and also climate change resilience. So today, I particularly want to share on the participatory data collection for Disability Inclusive City. So this initiative is, um, is a collaboration between uh, Kota Kita and also UNESCO. And it aims to reduce, first to reduce the gap in cities' disability data. It also aims to improve uh, evidence-based governance and also empowering persons with disabilities in advocating for basic services. So we did this initiative back in 2017, first in Solo, and then the next year we went to Banjarmasin in 2018 to, do, to replicate the same. So this initiative has only been uh, uh, conducted in two cities in Solo, first in Central Java and also uh, in Banjarmasin in South Borneo. And Actually, the final output of this participatory data collection is to create a city profile uh, for disability-inclusive city. And here are a few steps. So first, we collect the baseline data, we develop methodology, we implement the survey, we, uh, we enrich the data by, by uh, uh, conducting participatory workshop, we do data analysis, and then we were able to develop the city profile, and also we disseminate uh, uh, to the relevant stakeholders through a workshop. But if you see that, it seems like a lot of process, uh, but today uh, I would like to emphasize uh, on how do we collect the data. So we are collecting, during the data collection, we are using a digital technology. It's, it's a very simple digital technology. We are using an Android app base called Odeka Collect and then uh, Flock Tracker. Um, Flock, we use Flock Tracker in Solo and Odeka Collect in Banjarmasin. The reason why we are using these uh, apps is because first it's free, it's an open source, and it can be easily used by surveyors and also enumerators. And the findings, uh, I mean the data that are collected, can be monitored uh, in real time and also using geotagging. So we were able to create a spatial distribution of the person with disability and also create a spatial analysis from that. And regarding the surveyors, we work with volunteers who are local people there. So it can be from local youth and also local, um, local woman, woman group in, in, uh, in those cities. But before we, we deploy them to, uh, to do the data collection, of course, we did a training to get them familiar with the app and also the survey questions and also uh, train them on the ethical and code of code of conduct on how interviewing person with disabilities. And then furthermore, uh, during the data analysis, we're not doing it by ourselves, but we're also involving stakeholders um, through a focus group discussion. The stakeholders are representative from a person with disabilities, uh, DPOs or disabled people organization, and then also city, uh, city government officials to uh, showcase the data and validate uh, is it, you know, like, like for example, uh, why in this area they have a high concentration of person with disability. So we do this kind of discussion to, uh, to validate uh, our findings. And then uh, at last, what are the results from the participatory data collection? So if you see here uh, in Solo, we were able to uh, create uh, a disability inclusive city profile and also spatial distribution of person with disability using GIS apps. And in Solo, we were able to document uh, around 1,167 person with disability. And then in Banjarmasin, uh, we also uh, developed the same city profile and then also the um, the spatial distribution of person with disability. And in Banjarmasin, we were able to document around 3,897 person with disability living there. 
And the initiative just don't stop there. So as a matter of fact, it create impact, it create a multiplier effect, particularly in Banjarmasin cases. So the data also used by uh, government, so for example, uh, the data also used by uh, the committee, uh, the election committee in Indonesia to update uh, around 2,000 eligible voters with disabilities, and also the data, uh, the data also used by uh, social affairs department to help them distribute uh, social aid for persons with disability during COVID-19 pandemic and a recent flood disaster that happened in Banjarmasin a few years ago. And not only that, uh, the data also used by the private sector. So the private sector used the data to improve access to training and internship opportunities for persons with disability. And from our side, uh, we also use the data uh, as our baseline information uh, when we implement uh, inclusive pilot intervention through participatory approach. So for example, we work with um, students and students with disability to what we call it a participatory workshop, participatory design workshop or co-design workshop to develop a safe school zone uh, in, their, in their school. And another uh, example is uh, we also uh, engage um, residents, including residents with disability to uh, develop uh, an inclusive community hub through a co-design workshop. So from here, we realize how important, uh, how, how that is really important, especially for persons with disabilities, because through data, they can access this kind of needs and accessibility. And yeah, if you want to know more, uh, particularly on the participatory data collection methodology, we have guidelines, we have toolbox that are available online and free on our website. You can just go on our website and we also have um, social media for you if you want to follow. And I think that will be all from, from uh, my side, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just one question before we hand over to Nakul. Um, from what I understand, uh, this is more classic survey-based what you're doing. So it's on-the-ground surveys uh, where we try to reach as many people with disabilities. One group then reaches another group. So technology is, mm, of course, involved. You need this to collect the data and to aggregate it. But it's not in the data collection so far. And it's more than used to analyze the data. Is this correct? or? Am I getting something wrong? Yeah, so basically um, we're using uh, data technology like a data collection, like what I said, um, the, uh, the Odeka Collect and also Flocktaker to help us uh, document the result. And what is also interesting, because they use geotagging, so we were able to locate and pinpoint uh, each person with disability houses so that we were able to create the spatial distribution and then we did the spatial analysis with the GIS app. Uh, so we layer some, so for example, we, we did an overlay with um, poverty data and another land use and something. So we create a, a really um, comprehensive result through, because of the, the data collection itself that used geotagging. So it's really what makes it powerful. Thank you, Karana. Now, over to you, Nakul. Thank you. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really insightful to hear from Ron and uh, Kirana, of course, from you, the wonderful work you are doing. Uh, I'll try to share with you some insights of how uh, a big global organization like uh, Unilever tries to uh, address this particular subject area of purpose and of uh, having a more inclusive uh, culture and workforce. Uh, also, as I do that, uh, I apologize because I couldn't do that earlier. Just for audio description, I am a 40-year-old male. Uh, I'm wearing a jacket and uh, blue jeans and sitting very comfortably on my wheelchair. Uh, so let me also share with you how globally at Unilever, uh, we are trying to approach this overall uh, you know, theme of partnership uh, that uh, Denise uh, mentioned about in the earlier session, uh, and also how at Singapore, 
uh, we are working with different stakeholders and different partners in the ecosystem to build the change. Just to get us started, uh, Unilever is uh, one of the world's largest consumer good companies. Uh, we are strongly driven by our purpose, which is to make sustainable living commonplace. And we try to bring that to life and drive that by having three fundamental beliefs, which is that companies with purpose last, brands with purpose grow, and people with purpose thrive. Uh, we make some of the most beloved brands uh, in the world. Uh, here you can see some of them on your screen. Uh, there are over 400 brands uh, that we have in the house of Unilever. Uh, and also in a recent survey that Kantar did, uh, 13 out of the top 50 most loved brands in terms of market penetration uh, and also in terms of reach come from the house of Unilever. How do we do that, uh, if you ask? Of course, uh, the most important resource that any organization has are its people, uh, and it's the people who are the secret sauce. So we have over 149,000 uh, employees spread across, uh, spread across uh, 190 countries. Uh, almost 93% of our leaders are local to the market where they play. Uh, we have been voted as uh, number one FMCG graduate in over 54 countries. Uh, and we are very proud to achieve uh, our target of gender balance. Uh, we had set out uh, in 2010 to achieve this in 2020, and we actually achieved it a year earlier. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of work and conviction went behind uh, achieving that. Uh, there are also some bold commitments we have made in the space of uh, EDNI. Uh, the first one of which is that we want to achieve an equitable and inclusive culture by eliminating biases across all the levels. Uh, we want to accelerate diversity across all parts of leadership. We have also taken the ambition to have 5% of our workforce to be comprising of persons with disability by 2025. Uh, our brands, uh, as I shared earlier, are extremely well penetrated, and uh, Unilever is one of the biggest advertisers globally. What we have also taken uh, an ambition is to spend 2 billion uh, euros with diverse businesses worldwide by 2025, and we want to increase the representation of diverse groups even in our advertising because. As we all know, representation really matters. So that's Unilever globally, uh, a very quick overview of uh, what uh, or who we are in Singapore. Uh, so Singapore is Unilever's strategic global hub for driving business growths. Uh, some of our biggest brands uh, like Lifebuoy, like Pepsodent, Sunlight, uh, the entire marketing team as well as research and development happens here at Singapore. Uh, we were ranked number one as a workplace to grow your business in 2022. Uh, and of course, we partner very closely with SG Enable, uh, who has been sort of our uh, guiding compass in this entire journey of disability inclusion. Now, of course, a, a very important point that a lot of us, uh, you know, or question that a lot of us might be thinking is, if there's, this, there's so much to be done in this space, so how do we make our choices? How do we prioritize? And for that, there is an extremely simple framework that we actually employ, which you're going to see in the next slide. But of course, I'll also voice it out. So this is the global framework that we have for inclusion, driving inclusion, uh, which can also be replicated or adapted at any specific market level or by any business. So very simply put, we have the vision on the top, which is to be the number one employer of choice for persons with disability by 2025. That's, that's the vision that we have. Uh, how, how would we want to materialize that? Uh, that would be that we would want to have 5% of our workforce 
comprising of persons with disability by 2025. Now under that, what we also have done, which of course uh, uh, you don't see on the slide, is we have identified which are the key areas where we need to operate. So you know that could be in terms of the markets. Uh, it could also be in terms of the different functions. Uh, because considering uh, you know, the size and scale of Unilever, we have multiple departments in teams. So which are really those areas where the roles are designed for persons with disability to really thrive? And underneath that are the key enablers. The key enablers are essentially the important stakeholders in the entire ecosystem through which we can drive exponential change and impact. So we have a very simple philosophy in Unilever that if you want to drive any change, the first you know, uh, change begins at home. So first, we need to put our house in order, uh, which is why the first enabler would be in terms of talent. So these are the people, uh, the fantastic people who are in the organization. Followed that would be that how can our brands be a drive for change? Uh, so you know we have uh, many brands. Uh, I would like to take an example of Rexona, uh, which is also called Shore or Degree. You know if you're in Australia or you're in the US. And Rexona has a very strong purpose, which is to encourage people to move more. So a lot of the marketing activities, community outreach, what Rexona does is around encouraging people, everyone, not just persons with disability, to move more. Uh, and how do they bring it to life? Uh, Rexona, in a, about two years back, launched the world's first deodorant that was designed for persons with disability. So, if any of you are interested, I'll maybe share the link of that uh, advertisement with you. Uh, but it's, it's a wonderful example of how a product which is designed with inclusion from the very design, of course, becomes very important and essential for some, uh, but it's uh, useful for everyone. Along with the brands, uh, there are a lot of partners with whom we work, partners slash suppliers. So how can we again drive change with them which can impact both upstream as well as downstream? And the final one would be in terms of the community equity. Uh, and here again, I would uh, like to give a shout out to you know the work that we do with uh, SG Enable, which is for us to understand the areas where we can improve uh, and then also get in touch with multiple other stakeholders through which who we can partner and really drive this change. So uh, those are some of the things that uh, I wanted to share with you from a perspective of Unilever. Thank you. Thank you, Nakul. Um, just to add uh, to the uh, Unilever approach, um, you didn't mention this, but uh, a former CEO, and I forgot the name, you will know the name, uh, he is also a co-founder of a global initiative called the Valuable 500, which um, is a, 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 a global pledge of leading uh, multinationals to uh, create minimum standards in, uh, in employment, in inclusion and accessibility. And this former CEO is one of the driving force behind the foundation of this one. Mr. Paul Pullman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we got some 12 minutes left and I would like to spend this now with asking the three of you a question or maybe give a statement which you might agree to or forcibly disagree uh, and uh, just an ex give an explanation related to our initial approach of international work, co international cooperation and using technology. Um, so Ron, the statement that I would give and like to comment on this would be international cooperation would make a lot of sense for creating affordable and available technology because then you can create products and services by scale, uh, improving the price per unit and uh, creating international standards with all the advantages that comes with that. Would you agree? And uh, I think you will agree, but what would it mean in practice? How can, what, what would be, need to be done to get in this direction? So I definitely agree. I think uh, one thing that 
we really need to do is about sharing the knowledge and data. Because I think uh, anecdotally, when we go for network sessions, everybody has the same problem, right? Same problem statements that we are working on in our own in individual country. But I think there's a lack of sharing of data, our own shared experience. Uh, what did we learn from our own pilots in our own countries? What is the difficulties that we are going through? And actually, what are the successful ideas that actually has been gaining traction? And can we actually test bait it in across different countries so that we can adapt that solution and actually achieve that uh, economies of scale so that the market is the addressable, addressable market is a lot wider. So I think the key thing, key critical factor that I feel to this success is really about sharing of data and knowledge of our learned experience. Could you give one or two examples of technologies that you think are closer to getting to scale than others that you're maybe currently working on or that you're uh, in your research area? The part that I'm really keen on is about virtual assistants. So like you see from the smart home uh, technologies that we work with Google, right? The virtual assistants has, uh, I mean the way that Google and uh, Microsoft now with OpenAI has done it, is really collect data from all different parts of the world to really approve the AI algorithm, right? And it benefits to the disability community as well. So I think while the video that we showed is more tailored towards profiles of persons with physical or sensory disabilities, what is the opportunity that we also can apply virtual assistant technology to persons with intellectual disability and autism as well, right? Can we use virtual assistants to remind uh, persons with intellectual disability on doing their daily chores, right? Remember to do the laundry or remember to fix an appointment to see your doctor. So how can we collect data from uh, all the different uh, contexts of the different countries to really say what, to, how do we use virtual assistant to uh, assist the person with disabilities? And another very clear area that we would really like to get into is, I think, as with everyone, is about ChatGPT, right? <laughs> everyone is using it now to uh, see how it can be applied. So can we use ChatGPT? Uh, with correct training to use it to guide persons with uh, intellectual disability or persons with autism through their daily living. For example, can they ask ChatGPT, how do I deal with certain scenarios? So rather always be dependent on someone to guide them to communicate, could they use ChatGPT to guide them for communication as well? Thank you, Ron. Uh, Kirana, um, what would you think would be most impactful to scale your model, maybe scale it internationally. It's fascinating. It's giving incredibly good insights. You're creating wonderful reports. What would be needed that someone from another country picks this up and says, well, let's work together. This is, this is, this is really good. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for the questions. So I think from our reflection, um, our aim is to you know, create CD to, be become, to become more inclusive and and what we see through data, inclusive city can start with inclusive data. So data can play a pivotal role so that everyone can get their basic service, can get access, can go everywhere because of the data. And from our reflection is that um, collaboration is also important. So creating network and we're uh, involving everyone in the city, like from the government, NGOs, uh, CSO, and even person with disability itself is very crucial. And I do really encourage uh, everyone in the room to you know, go to our website and see the guideline. And it's really um, potential to be replicated because the city profile provides a contextual uh, in, in each city. Because, you know, when we're talking about issue, each city, each country can have um, different issue. What we see in Indonesia and Singapore can be different, right? So through the data that we collected and we create, we develop the city profile and create a, um, a more comprehensive result. So from our, uh, from our um, you know, uh, the project that in, in, in Banjarma City in Solo, that it create a multiplier effect. So I think it's, it's really great if, can, if this initiative can be replicated anywhere, anywhere in the world. Thank you. 
Uh, Karen, one more question, more related to the uh, digitalization of, of your approach. Um, I'm also referring to an existing model that uh, was presented, I think, two years ago in, in Vienna. It's sponsored by Microsoft together with GSU ICT. What they do, and this also reflects to the project that we just heard on mapping a city, is um, they let wheelchair users register on, on an app, uh, and then they monitor via GPS the movements of these uh, wheelchair users. So you get real time, like you do this on, on Google Maps and you see the traffic in Singapore, you see the actual routes that uh, wheelchair users take. And just thinking of this, not only about the routes of wheelchair users, but about uh, what other people with disabilities are doing, when they're they are doing what. Are you exploring this model as well of digitalizing? I would be too much into data secrecy or uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of uh, getting into new types of data into your model. Sorry, what you're saying is data protection and privacy, something like that. Is the, I think there might be a privacy issue mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. from the outset this would, of course, enhance yeah. your model a lot. No? Yeah, so I think data protection and privacy is very crucial, especially regarding persons with disability. So uh, in our initiative uh, within the participatory data collection, we also give an informed consent to all, part, uh, to all person with disability that we are collected. So to be honest, not all of them want to be documented. Not all of them want to be recognized as person with disability. And whenever we uh, give the data to the government, to private sectors, we didn't just give the data as as it is the raw data, but we filter, and even we have like a handover process because it's related to data protection and uh, privacy of the person with disability that we documented. And regarding the geotagging, it's because we have the data of their uh, houses, particularly the, the, the geotag, the GPS of their houses, it's only owned by us and we only show the spatial distribution so we didn't share that to uh, everyone who needed it, but we, we give the name, we give the disaggregated data, we give the address, but not, but not the, uh, the geotagging because it's related to the privacy. Okay, thank you, Karana. <clears throat> Nakula, a question to um, data technology and the usage of your products. Um, how much do you know um, what features, accessibility features, your customers are actually using and also what challenges they face when using a, a soap or an, an ice cream. Do you know something about this and is this a, a perspective for the future to better understand uh, the needs of users and improve the accessibility of an ice cream or a deal or whatever? Yeah, so actually... More targeted towards, towards Nakul. Cool. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. okay. But you, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so like I shared, uh, there are some brands from Unilever uh, which do a business of more than a billion euros in a year. Now, of course, for a brand to grow to that size, it is extremely important that uh, we understand our consumers really well. So there are uh, dedicated teams within the house of Unilever who single-handedly focus on consumer empathy uh, and they understand each and every part about how the consumers really interact with our brands. And that exists from, you know, the entire time that when they even think about, uh, oh, I, I have run out of a soap and I need to buy something. So, and that's the time when we would like them to see an advertisement uh, for a Dove soap bar. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know, there are multiple cues through which we also influence the way they interact uh, with our brands on the shelf. Uh, so again, to the point, uh, we have already started industrializing uh, certain frameworks through which the packaging that we have is more accessible. Now, a lot of uh, our shoppers, and you know, we can also say for ourselves, we are buying products on the e-commerce platforms. So how do we also ensure that the product image that we have the color tones that are used over there can be recognized with certain people who can't really distinguish between the red, green, and blue. Uh, how does the product name also becomes legible? Uh, you know, so there are multiple 
areas th throughout the consumer journey uh, that we try to understand really well uh, and accordingly we try to design our products. Are we perfect across the entire spectrum? Uh, definitely no. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a learning process, but definitely in some areas we are doing better uh, and that really, uh, I would also link that maybe to Michael, the first question that you, uh, you know, asked Ron about uh, international uh, cooperation. Uh, of course, that's a no-brainer, it, it makes sense, but what, what I have seen being really effective uh, is about having those, you know, small pocket of excellence, having certain specific areas, uh, where the proof of concept can be run, initial positive results can be identified, uh, and then you know people are rewarded with the right incentives to really share that story uh, and uh, make it as business as usual. We're already out of time, but one more question, a quite direct one. Uh, new technologies also up, open up new obvious uh, opportunities to make products more accessible, for example, QR codes on packages. Are you actively embracing this or using this uh, with, at Unilever already? Oh yes, uh, for the longest time, you know, we used to get these case studies from China where QR codes are being used by Alipay, uh, and there was also always a hesitation that no, QR code, like, do we really expect to, for people to take out their phones, etc. And then the pandemic happened, and you know, within a year, I would say the adoption of QR codes, but also, the overall acknowledgement that assistive technology or remote work can be made extremely productive and inclusive via assistive technology, I think that belief has just, uh, or that conviction mm -hmm. with the leadership and across all levels mm -hmm. uh, has been extremely encouraging to see. Okay, thank you. Now a final round and be really quick as possible. Um, is there anything you wanted to say but forgot to say during your presentation? So this is the last chance, uh, Ron. <laughs> uh, Kirana and Nakul, anything that comes to mind that you don't want to miss the chance to say right now? Uh, I guess what I, what I would just want to say uh, is that uh, in this space there is no blueprint there is no guide, like no one has really figured out how to do this. Having effective partnerships and learning from each other sounds like, uh, sounds like the right thing to do. So yes, I would like to encourage everyone, uh, you know, let's figure this out together. Okay. Kirana, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think I would have agreed with uh, Nako just said, I think what we do in here, we're learning from each other, is really, we create an ecosystem that can create a better city, a better inclusive, inclusive city. And I do believe that, I think after this, we can do more collaboration together and to create a city that is more inclusive, especially for persons with disabilities. Yeah, so, uh, I think I repeat that, but I'll commit ourselves, because like this morning, I think Zero Project at SG Enable has signed the MOU, and the intent is really to keep this exchange, the networking going, and it's not just a one-off event, but we have plans for the long term to really work with partners around the region, uh, the Asia-Pacific region, to really uh, improve the network, share the knowledge, and I, I say in my slides, to have collective growth together across the countries. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Karan. Thank you, Nakul, for this engaged discussions. And I think you all deserve a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you.